stand with me. Uh, the days of getting down my knees and getting back up in front of you are over with. And uh, that's just fine with me because that's the first miracle of every one of our services is getting up. And so, Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. We thank you, Father, for a mighty move of your spirit in our hearts and in our lives tonight. We thank you for the word of God that came forth from this place this day. This day has been filled with salvations and the word of God. What a great message, Pastor. Our senior pastor brought us. It was wonderful. And Lord, we just absolutely bless you. Thank you so much that we come in the house of God and have an uncompromised word of the Lord spoken to us with real great insight by your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we haven't come to hear from a man or woman, but we have come to hear from you as the teacher. Now, here's how that works, Holy Spirit. We give to you our hearts now. We say, come, fill it with your way, your will, your want, your desire, uh, your plan for our life, because you love us and you have a plan for each and every one of us to take us down a path to prosper us in every area of your life. And God will give you the praise and give you the glory as the word of God tonight becomes alive on the inside of us. And we thank you, Father, for a mighty move of your spirit. Now, Lord, also we don't just bless ourselves, but we ask that you would bless all the churches in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet that are preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. There are our brothers and our sisters, Lord. We're not here to judge another man's servant. They're yours, and we bless them, Father. If they're telling somebody about Jesus, and if they're there, Lord, uh, preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, then we ask you to bless them wherever they may be in this community around the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. In Jesus' mighty name, we are all in agreement, and we say amen. amen. Go ahead and take a seat. Get your Bible. Go with me, if you will, into Mark in the fourth chapter. Tonight, this is really an interesting message. God gave this to me while I was talking to somebody. I had no idea. I wasn't even thinking about it. I'd mentioned it to Pastor Dan and Pastor Jess and Pastor Deborah and, uh, at lunch one day, and they all stopped and said, you need to minister that to the church. And I, I uh, hadn't even thought of, about such a thing. But, and then since then, I've been thinking about it, and God's been dealing with me a lot about this. I'm going to give you a title, but I, I, I don't want to talk to you about the title because it's different. It's called The Worship of a Storm. Now, I don't know many storms of life that you're going through that you can find worship in, but it ought to be that way. There ought to be a worship in a storm. For a mature Christian, and that's what we're going to do is take a look at how to become that Christian is where you go past the natural senses that tell you that you've got problems and trials and pressures. And you get to a place, and I'll show you how to do that tonight, where in the midst of the storm, you are operating in what would be called, according to God, worship. And it's important for all of us to hear this message, so I'm asking you to really clarify your thinking right now, or clear up your thinking right now, to the place where you will uh, hear clearly the things of God as God speaks. The storms we all have in life, and some of you might be in the middle of a storm, but I promise you before the end of your life, you'll be facing storms of life. How you handle those storms determines is, and is determined by what's on the inside of you and how much you allow the things of God to come out when in the midst of a storm. You, in a sense, will determine your own storms, the outcome of each person's storm. A storm could be a marriage. A storm could be in your work. A storm could be in your economics, money. A storm could be on your job or people that you work with on the job. A storm can be relatives, and certainly storms could be children. There's all kinds of storms in life that knock people off of their feet and discourage them so they never really go on with God. But, you know, dealing with the storms of life the right way has a lot to do with your future success with God. Dealing with the storms the wrong way will cause you to be weary and 
faint and fail in your endeavor to be all that God has called you to be. So therefore, we come to a place like this where the Spirit of God speaks to us about how to deal with these storms of life and take the storms of life that brings us to a place where God can silence the storms in our life. There's this wonderful time in Jesus' ministry where he's going all over the place and he's teaching the crowds and never really speaks much understanding of English. He's just giving them parable after parable and the crowds are ooing and aahing over it. They're not quite sure how to deal with this. And he gets his disciples aside and he, he starts to explain the parables to his disciples. And when he does, something fascinating takes place. He just stops explaining and he makes a statement. He says, let's go over to the other side, which is this big lake, lake, uh, if you will, of, of Galilee, which we've been on many times. And, and uh, it's fascinating. And it's big enough that Storms come up on this lake. When the wind blows, uh, you'll find that there's great waves just like an ocean. In fact, it's hard to imagine that a freshwater body would have storms just as big as an ocean and waves almost as big as oceans out there. Their boats in those days were a whole lot smaller than the boats today made you know, with wood and of course put together differently and storms sometimes took a lot of people's lives out in the Sea of Galilee. They were notorious. They came up all of a sudden as the wind blew and he finds him and his disciples in a boat. But if I may take you to the fourth chapter and I'm going to read you a story. It's not a parable. It's an actual truth of what took place with Jesus and his disciples. But I want you to see something. This is not a story so that we can learn a story. This is not just something being said in scripture so you can learn a story. This is God's way of speaking to us about the storms of our life. How to settle those storms and still those storms, no matter what they are. There are three simple things that we can see, no matter where you're at, going through whatever type of storm you're going through, whether it be a storm of health, whether it be a storm of life, whatever it is, the storm that you're facing, how to still that storm has a lot to do with how you approach the storm. And we find something taking place that's so interesting to us. And we're going to learn there are some things that we can see that are obvious as we read this, and we'll point those out to you. A couple of points that are so obvious that everybody's going to be bored after looking at them. But the third point is the most interesting and the third point comes from the revelation of the Holy Spirit that makes it all different than any of the others. May I take you to the fourth chapter of Mark, verse, starting in verse number 35. On the same day when the evening had come, he, notice a capital H in the word he. One of the things I like about the Old King James and the New King James is they're respectful about who's speaking here. Oftentimes, the other translations, the word he will not even be capitalized, and you're trying to read it and figure out are they talking about God or are they talking about just somebody? But here it's quite clear that every time you see the word that's capitalized in the New King James, he said to them, that's God, his disciples, let us cross over to the other side. And now when they had left the multitude, so here's all the multitude that he's been teaching the parables to, all the people that were following, they took him along in the boat as he was. And other little boats were also with him. Now the storm starts, if you will, in verse number 37. And a great windstorm <clears throat> arose. I don't know about you, but when I see the word great, all of a sudden, this is not just a little wind. This is something that's going to move plants, going to move water, move the atmosphere, move everything. A great, God sees it as a great windstorm. He says, arose, and the waves beat into the boats so that it was already filling. 
Verse number 38 says, but he, speaking of Jesus, was in the stern asleep on a pillow. Stop right there, look back up at me. Here we see Jesus at the back of the boat. You know, there's a bow and there's a stern. Bow was in the front, the stern is in the back. That's the aft part of the boat. And here we see Jesus in the back of this boat by himself on a pillow and he is asleep, out. I mean, the wind's blowing, the waves are coming over the side, the boat's starting to fill with water. I'm sure there are people with some kind of buckets throwing water back out. People are starting to panic, and here's Jesus in the middle of a storm, listen to me, saying something to you tonight. In the back of the boat, asleep. And they awoke him. And they said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? In verse number 39, it goes on and makes this statement. And he arose and he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was a Great, I love the word great again, calm, man, it's level, flat, just as sweet as it can be. Verse number 40, but he said to them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, who is this? This can be, who, who, who can this be that even the wind of the sea Obey him. So many messages have been taught about this story, about faith, about fear, about power, about authority of Jesus. But I don't know that anybody's ever taught what you're going to hear in a few moments. Not because I'm special, but because he's special. And he, I believe with all of my heart, wants to talk to you about something very amazing. Some of the things that we can see from the men that are with Jesus is obviously you see fear in them. From the men that are in the boat in, with Jesus, you see lack of faith, faithfulness. If you will, you will see questions with Jesus. They'll They've gotten to the place where they're so uncomfortable in the condition that they're in, in the midst of the storm, they start to question and accuse Jesus of stuff. Which is really interesting because oftentimes when we're in the middle of a battle of our lives, we do exactly the same thing. Faith flies out the window, fear starts to come in, and what do we do? We start accusing God, saying, God, where are you? Don't you care about us? I've served you. I gave my tithe. I go to church. I'm a believer. I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. What's going on, God? And we start to go from the one who just awakens Jesus to the accuser of Jesus, which is fascinating in itself. You see that taking place on the men's part. It's easy to see where the men failed because Jesus points it out. You're in fear. He says that two times in verse number 40 and verse number 41. Then he calls them faithlessness. You have no faith whatsoever. We see that. But then you go on and if you want to go past the average understanding of this, the normal understanding of this, the obvious understanding of this, and get into what Jesus is really trying to say by being in a sleeping position at the back of the boat in the middle of a battle, a storm, then that's where the rubber meets the road, and that's where, my friends, we grow. That's what changes us from Christians, just being Christians who can understand the obvious to Christians who can see the spiritual. And that's where the Holy Spirit would like to take us tonight, if, if I may share that with you. Let's talk about, there are three things I'm gonna share with you tonight, but God gave to me to give to you, which are amazing. The first two, are, again, are the obvious. 
But the third one is the one we're going to really zero in on. Let's talk about the obvious. Some of you are brand new. You don't know anything much about Scripture at all. And uh, so we're going to talk about the first obvious thing that we see by looking at these men. And then not looking at the men, looking at Jesus. One thing that Jesus has that the men don't have, if you will, is something called confidence. Somehow in his connection with the Father, and he has quite a connection, he makes a statement over and over again in Scripture. He says, the words that I speak are not my words, but he that sent me. And then he says words like this. He says, when you see me, you see the Father. When they ask, show us the Father. And then he says things like, have you been with you so long that you don't recognize uh, who I am? And sometimes we don't recognize what faith really is all about. This confidence in who we are is wonderful, but the confidence in who backs us. And we believe he backs us in times that are good, but when the pressure comes and things don't look so good, after a while we start to lose our confidence. Let me say it differently. We start to lose our faith. And we get to the place where now we're in fear because we lost our faith, and we're now about ready to become accusers of what we believe God should do and be. And the first thing that we see from the life of Jesus is he's obviously in an amazing, confident, faithful position in the back of that boat. You don't see him. Don't think for a moment. If you've ever, I've slept in boats, and my son Luke and I have been in boats together where all night long we tossed and turned and literally threw us from one side of the bunk to the other side of the bunk uh, until the morning we were grateful for our mooring ball that held us in place. And, and I was grateful when it was over with the morning, and finally we could get a, maybe an hour of sleep or something in the morning towards the morning because the storms, uh, waves, and there were nothing more than surges coming in from the ocean that lifted the boat up and tossed it to the side. But here's a storm, and a storm tosses a boat in every direction. It doesn't just top the boat in one direction where the boat goes up and down and you can kind of comfort yourself and make yourself in a place where you could sleep. It's not that way at all. With a storm, it comes from you all different directions. The, the surges of the ocean break from the right, left. It knocks the boat back and forth. It's a very dangerous time being a sailor. I understand that. And I find myself in a place of just, number one, amazement at looking at Jesus that he is asleep. How in the world could he be so comfortable on that pillow that he could be asleep? I would think, Jesus, you should be getting up. Grab a hold of one of the buckets and start loading the water out of the boat. Help us in this place. You can see the panic in the guys. I'm sure they're not trying to be quiet. They're not saying to themselves, you know, we need to just whisper because Jesus is sleeping in the back and we don't want to wake Jesus up right now. Let's let him sleep on his pillow because he's had a hard time teaching everybody all of those parables. How many know, realize that God doesn't need any rest? And yet, at the same time, he's saying something. Do you know that more things are said in the Bible by not saying something by what's taking place? He is saying something by his lifestyle at that very moment. By what he is doing, the words are louder than if he said them with his mouth. And what we do oftentimes is we only go for what obvious instead of going for what is real. Faith had to be in Jesus to a place of amazing confidence that he could be at what? Peace. The proof, if you will, the proof, if you will, of faith is rest. And Jesus says at this restful position, it wasn't torment, it isn't torture, it isn't worry. The proof of faith isn't just speaking it out all the time. The proof of whether a person is in faith or not is whether or not they're at peace and rest. During the midst of the battle. That's what you see. I like what it says, and I'm going to put it up for those of you that are new, because most of us know this by heart. But let's talk about it just for a second. The weird thing about faith is this. 
Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And it's a really crazy expression of faith. Here we're looking at Hebrews, the 11th chapter, verse number one. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Listen to what I'm going to say to you. Faith has proof. And the proof is that hope that you hold on to. And it is hope that you are holding on to in something you do not see. You do not have to have faith in something you see. You Now when you see it, you know you have it. But when you don't see it, and that's the toughest part, when you don't see the storm stopping and the, star, st- the surge keeping on going, and the, when you don't see the, you know, the waves start to come and sink your boat, that's when the disciples freak out and go after Jesus and wake him up. And the only thing they did what was good while they were in the middle of that storm is they woke up Jesus, but they did it the wrong way. They woke him up with it accusation and they should have woke him up with faith he should have got up and said wow that was a great sleep boy you guys are got it great because faith is a proof of things not seen some of you want proof immediately you're going to take some time so not seeing it before it comes to pass from the beginning of the bible the end of the bible you see that god's not in any hurry to fulfill and take the pressure off you. It's in the midst of the pressure that you stand strong in the things of God while the boat is rocking and rolling, while the waves are coming in, whatever it might be in your life that you're going through, that battle that you're going through in your life. May I say this to you? God's not gonna come along and tinkerbell with a magic wand and just get rid of the problem. He doesn't get rid of the problems. He helps you to get through the problems. For we, listen to this. We, we go through the valley of the shadow of death. We don't camp in the valley. We're going through it. Too many of you have been camping there too long. and All of a sudden you become the accuser of where are you, God? So here we find faith. And there's no other way to please God. In this particular situation, they were very unpleasing to God. And he called them, man, how long is it going to take for you to have some faith? You're walking in fear it's ridiculous fear. I could feel you all over. You woke me up. This is ridiculous. My goodness, have you not understand that I'm God in the back of your boat? My goodness, my friends, God's in the back of your boat. Why in the world would you? And the God that's in the back of your boat, he's hooked up with the heavenly father. He is the heavenly father. And I'm here to tell you something. Guess what? There are no problems you could ever have that a storm can knock you out. That's faith. Is anybody listening? So we see a second thing that takes place with the men that are in the boat. The second thing's in the middle of the battle is they're falling apart. They're losing, if you will, control of everything. They find themselves in a place where they're absolutely out of control. So the number second thing, and the second thing for us to take a look at is, if you will, this, is controlling your flesh. And here's the situation that a lot of people don't understand. You see Jesus in the back. He's all God, right? Right? Let me say it again. Jesus is all God, and he's all man. That's what makes him so totally wonderful. Now he can relate with you because he's all God and he's all what? All man. And he has flesh just like you. He feels things like you do. He felt the pressure. He felt discouragement, frustration. Everything that you have ever felt in your life, Jesus has felt. That's why he becomes our advocate in heaven that says, Father, now wait a minute. I've been there. I've experienced. Now, Jesus created all of us, but he never felt us in the flesh. When he became a man, now he could feel what you feel. That's what scripture tells us. And so all of a sudden, there's something that must take place because if you don't have faith with flesh that is controlled, you will find your flesh will control your faith. And that's what took place with these men that their faith 
was watered down and lost because their flesh overruled their faith. Now let me tell you something. When you got the Holy Spirit, when you got saved, when you got saved, listen, I'm going to say it one more time. When you got saved, you got the Holy Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit, there's a product that the Spirit of God that's on the inside of you, inside of you and me, produces a product that the Spirit of God inside of us produces. And if you'll find this, it's in the fifth chapter of Galatians. It's love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. And then it comes to a word called temperance in the old King James. Temperance is misunderstood massively by the church. Temperance is not translated self-control. It should have been translated for our easy understanding, godly controlled of self. And what we don't realize, God is not looking for people to be self-controlled. We've been self-controlled since we fell in the garden by partaking of the tree of knowledge of good and of evil. That's how our self came in there and we make our own decisions from that particular point. So God's not looking for someone to be self-controlled. And you can be self-controlled by getting strong and lasting for a little while. But let me tell you something, and you might not make it by being self-controlled, and God knows that. But when you're godly controlled of self, makes all the difference in the world. And so therefore, the product of the Holy Spirit that's produced on the inside of me and you, if you're born of the Spirit of God, Listen to this, that product is godly control. And we see that in scripture, that if you're gonna have faith, listen, if you keep whining and bellyaching and bawling and squalling and your flesh is just constantly meditating it and you're frustrated over it, you see the waves coming into your boat in the middle of your storm, can I just say something to you? It won't be long before you give up. And you cry out with accusations to God, where are you, God? Just like these guys are doing. And they have lost complete control of themselves. Why? Because they have really not been controlled by what God says, only by what their flesh says. We're a senses-orientated people. The senses that we have, the seeing, hearing, tasting, touching, smelling, senses, determine everything for us. We make decisions in life based on what senses tell us. Case in point, you're in a room and you start to hear something popping and smelling. You look around, it's starting to flood with, with, with smoke. Your senses say, the room is on fire, get out. Thank God for those senses. They're important. You're driving down the freeway and all of a sudden you realize you're going too fast and your car's not running as well as it does. Your senses immediately, your feeling and your hearing and your vibrations and your thinking process, your senses says slow down, get right. And prayerfully you do. But the senses also work a whole lot of other areas besides good. They work a lot of bad areas. Someone cuts you off on that freeway and almost runs you out of your lane, all of a sudden your senses say, man, and you want to give the guy a finger pull up and start yelling and screaming and you got road rage going on. And guess what? That's just a product of senses. Something took place. And senses oftentimes can either be good or bad, but if they're godly controlled, they're always good. And that's what a lot of people don't understand. Their senses said something beyond their knowledge. Their knowledge was, this is the Son of God. Their knowledge was, this is God incarnate. Their knowledge was, this is, is in my boat. Their knowledge is, well, he is going to do great things. Miracles take place. But their senses says, oh, no, we're going to sink. We got to fight. We got to get him up. We got to start asking him what's going on and get him to change things. And they lost literally control because they couldn't godly control their flesh. And when you can't godly control your flesh, it won't be long before your faith is undermined 
and you do just what they did in the middle of your battle. Bible says in Romans 6 chapter, maybe just jump there, let's just put it up on the overhead. In verse number 12, it says, therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey the lust of it. Now watch, I think this is fascinating. Notice what God says in the scripture and how he says it. Do not let, let me say it again. I don't know if you got that or not. Do not let. He didn't say I will keep sin out of your life. He didn't say I'll keep you, you know, in a cocoon where you never have any problems. He said the call is yours not to let sin in. And sometimes, because we don't have any control of our flesh, instead of not letting sin in, we let it in. And then the repercussions of that is, oh, God, help us. And we're miserable. Verse number 13 comes along. It says, do not present your members as instruments. So the option to present your members, your body, your flesh, as an instrument of something, listen to this, is your option. He wouldn't tell you to do something you can't do, and he wouldn't tell you to do something unless that's the way it should be. So when he says, do not present your instruments, speaking of your flesh or your body, members, he's saying it because it's your option to present yourself any way you want to present yourself. It's not God. He says, of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourself to God being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. We go to the next verse, if you will. And it says, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. And it goes on and says, you know, in the next verse, so shall we sin because we're certainly not. Verse 16 comes along, makes this statement. Do you not know that whom you present your self slaves to obey? That means your flesh. You are that one slave. In other words, if you present yourself in sin to Satan, to, to, to sinly ways, it won't be long before you are a slave to that sin. So now he's telling us that we can control by the power of the Holy Spirit what our body tells us to do. They failed to do that in that boat. But Jesus didn't. How do I know that? He's asleep. He's comfortable. He's at peace. In fact, he's not just sitting there staring at him. He's making a point to all of us. He's beyond just sitting in the back of the boat watching these guys. He's trying to make a point. He is at the ultimate time of rest. You know what that is? Sleep. And he's at sleeping in the back of the boat for a reason. So you and I get the picture that his flesh is totally under control. How do I know that was important to Jesus? He would have never gone to the cross if his flesh wasn't controlled. How do I know that's positive? He would have never made it through the crucifixion if his flesh wasn't under godly control. And the fact that he makes it through the crucifixion, crucified, raised from the dead, following the plan of God, listen to this, my friends, proves that he had something that the guys in the front of the boat did not have. He had control over his flesh. His flesh was every bit as active as theirs. But he, by the power of the Holy Spirit, didn't let his flesh get out of hand and brought it back into check. And that's what these verses are saying. Because without it, he would never have made it to Golgotha Hill in Calvary. Fascinating. But let me take you to number three. To me, this is the most important because when the Spirit of God spoke this to me, it like changed my thinking about everything. And I said earlier, there's something we see with Jesus that we don't see with the men. In the middle of the storm, he is worshiping the Father. You say, guy, come on, Pastor, I've read that passage. There is absolutely no way in the world he is worshiping God, which brings us to what Jesus was doing that we need to see. This is, the, this is not the obvious. This is what's taking place by what he is doing and what we see him doing 
shows him worshiping the Lord. You say, how? That's, that's crazy. Let me make this statement to you. Now I have him put it up on the overhead. Worship is how and what you do and from your life. It's how you do and what you do from your life is worship. It is not a song. It is not a note. It is not a tune. Listen to me. I am no skills whatsoever. I remember as a young Christian saying to God, God, I just want to worship you all my life. And I'll never forget it. When I sat down at a piano, I said, God, I want to worship you. Teach me how to play the piano. Do you think God could have inspired me to sit at that piano and play? Of course he could have. He can do anything he wants to do. I sat down at that piano and I started to sing and I started to play and it sounded like somebody just killed a cow. <laughs> the music was horrific and horrible. I didn't understand it. God, if you want me to worship, why don't you teach me how to play the piano or give me the gift? Why don't you teach me how to sing at least on tune? So I decided what I would do because I really wanted with my whole life to worship God. That's all I've ever really wanted to do. So I got a hold of a guitar and I said, I'll just start with a guitar, forget the piano. I found out that I couldn't even tune the guitar. I didn't know how to tune the guitar. You know, to tighten it up, what that sound is the one that's supposed to be at, I don't know that at all. It didn't, didn't click. And when I sang, I was just as horrible as anybody you could ever imagine. So I figure, I guess I'm just not a worshiper. Wrong. Because anything and everything that I do with my life that shows God is a worship to God. Are you following me? So when Jesus is in the back of the boat asleep, he is saying, God, I know there's a storm. I know there's a battle, but I'm just going to be in you. And I'm going to be in such rest. And that was a time of worship for Jesus to the Father. Anything and everything that you do in Christ Jesus, anything, anything is a worship to God. And that's the kind of worship it's supposed to be. I was telling John Wineglass this morning after this morning services, we were having lunch together, and I told him, worship, John. He's been contracted to do uh, a... Uh, uh, a, a new concert. And, uh, and I was telling him about worship. And I was telling him that worship is not a sound. It's not just a note. And he's, you know, that's his whole life is music. Worship is the what you live that is to God every day. In the midst of your battle, you live out God's ways you are worshiping God at that moment. Are you following me? And you know, the point being for all of us in here, we can live our lives as worshipers the right way. Not that music's bad or wrong, believe me. And I was telling John today that worship is felt like beauty is seen. You know, and his eyes are about this big. I said, worship is felt, music is felt like a picture is seen. You show me a beautiful sunset or a sunrise or a sailboat on an ocean or the jagged cliffs of Northern California with the waves breaking against it or, or the, the Dome of the Rock or whatever it's called or the, or, or the Half Dome up at Yosemite and all the beautiful things that California has to offer and you put it in a frame of a picture and you look at that and you say, wow, that's God's creation. And it tells us that nature, the Bible says in Romans, that nature cries out about the Godhead. Well, nature is the visual spot of it Music is the sound of it. And so here you find that when music gets to a certain place and played a certain way, what it does, it touches the strings of your heart and brings you before the Father in incredible 
worship. And we have taken that experience and now call it worship in the church. And we have lost the real meaning of worship. The real meaning of worship is how you live your life, whether you live it to God or you live it for yourself. And when you live your life to the things of God, you are now a worshiper of God. And that's what a lot of people don't understand. So in the midst of a storm and in the midst of a battle, in the midst of a trial, in the midst of waves coming into my boat, I can put my head down and fall asleep in my, listen to this, in my faith because my life and physical body is under control of the Holy Spirit and it produces in that moment a worship to God. So when I walk with a limp and I feel the pain. To me, every feeling is a worship to you, God, because I'm in faith for you healing me and I'm in faith, listen to this, my body is in control. The flesh is not running to accuse Jesus that he hasn't healed me. So every stroke of pain becomes a worship to God because when the subject comes from pain uh, to my mind my mind is under the control of the Holy Spirit my faith is already in place and I'm here to tell you something whether it heals me or doesn't heal me from the pain isn't the issue all I know is every time I take a step I'm worshiping God because my faith is in there Here's how that works. I pop it up and let me see if I can explain it a little better like this. So faith is a product that you operate in. But it doesn't work unless you're controlled in your flesh. And that leads to great worship. Are you following me? And what Jesus was demonstrating in the back of the boat for every single one of us wasn't great faith. Oh yeah, it was, but not that wasn't just godly control. Oh yeah, it was that, but not just that. What Jesus was really demonstrating in the back of the boat was great worship. And what we say in the book of Hebrews, the 11th chapter of Hebrews, we call it the hall of fame of faith. It's not. It is not the hall of fame of faith, Hebrews 11th chapter. It is the hall of fame of worship. Faith that produced godly control, that produced great worship. I was gonna put up Genesis 22, five. I'll just pop it up for you real quick. First time the word worship is ever used. Had nothing to do with an instrument had to do with obedience to the things of God where Abraham was going to sacrifice his son whom he loved very much. And he got a double blessing. Man, it woke God up because he saw him do just what he said he was going to do. He put his flesh down, walked in faith. His flesh was controlled and he entered into, first time the word is ever used in the Bible, worship. And there wasn't an instrument, a drum, a song, or a singing of any kind. What did I just say to you? Tonight, you have the ability, through the power of the Holy Spirit, to become one of the greatest worshipers on the planet. It's not about your talent, my friends. It's not about your gifting. (laughs) That would be so shallow. We love talent and giftings. It's about your obedience. In the midst of a storm. Could you put the title of the storm of this message back up? And now the title makes sense. The worship of a storm. If God spoke to you tonight, give him a great big praise the Lord. Did you do that? That's all he spoke to you? That's all? It's just a little clappy, clappy? 
You know darn good that, that you know darn well that's good. Every time there's a problem, I have a choice to control my flesh, walk in faith, and I'll worship God in the midst of the frustration that I see and experience, whatever it might be, whatever storm it might be, whether it's sickness, illness, family, marital problems, whatever it might be, I want to become one of the greatest worshipers on this planet. Has anybody got it? Raise your hand if you got it. All right, now one more time, give the Lord and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, we love you. Thank you, Jesus. God is so good.